Thank you for joining us and welcome to another episode of Legal Unicorns. Um, as those who listen to the podcast regularly know, the purpose of the podcast is to interview astounding lawyers, outstanding and astounding, um, across the African continent who are doing things slightly differently and taking their career in a very inspiring way and, and inspiring direction. Uh, I am delighted this week to be joined by my good friend, Corrine Holtzkamp. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, it's lovely to be here, Rob. Kareen is, for those of you, uh, well, for full disclosure, for those that are listening, Kareen is a, is a very good friend of my wife's, one of her best friends, um, and is someone that I met nearly 20 years ago. I've watched her career uh, as a lawyer in South Africa take shape um, and, and in, a f in fascinating ways. And as you've point, pointed out off camera a second ago, and we'll get into, you're someone as a professional who tech has really followed you or you've followed tech. And, and I'm really excited to, to dig into that and find out more about, about that as we go forward. Um, you've got a, a vast background across a, a number of different sectors within the law, you've, which we will get onto as, as we track your career to where you're going. Um, and obviously more recently, you have moved into the what I'm coining as the agritech space yeah. with uh, with the the brilliant uh, earthworm in, uh, invention um, under your own firm, Agri Revolution, which again is so inspiring to show uh, the listeners that are watching or, and listening, uh, whether it's on Spotify or Google, where it may be, that though their careers can also take a, a interesting directions and they can take advantage of opportunities that come around. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for joining. Um, I really want to dive straight in. And, and again, off camera, I've said I've, I've known you for nearly 20 years, but I, I, could, I don't know that much about you. So where, where did you grow up, your family? Tell us all about where you, where you started. Sure. Um, so um, I grew up in, when I was little, my dad was, the, was at Groot Constantia. So I spent some years there before we moved to Stellenbosch. He started his own business. And so I spent my schooling there and then went to university in Stellenbosch too. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, for those who are listening aren't familiar, uh, i get the pronunciation right, Hruk Constantia is a wine farm and your dad was a farm manager there, was he? Or, he was, yeah. yeah. So he's a, he's a trained winemaker and he was um, a farm manager, a farm manager for um, – I think he was appointed when he was only 25. Okay. Yeah, it's actually crazy. Um, and so a lot of what you see on the farm today were things that my dad had put in place. So it's, oh, amazing. it's always wonderful for us to go back. And anyone that is listening from overseas, that is like one of the places that you must. In fact, if you get on a coach, it will take you there. It will take you there. It's a beautiful <laughs> setting. Many people get married there. It's an unbelievable part of the Western Cape. Not too far out of Cape Town as well, which is which is nice. Um, okay, so you grew up in in Stellenbosch. Now I know this, but your your mum, your dad, and your brother, right? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So, and everybody's still in this this part of the part of the world. Yeah, still, well, kind of Cape Town, Stellenbosch ish. <laughs> yeah. So you went to school where Stellenbosch? Stellenbosch, yeah. So um, Akerstadt Primary, and then uh, uh, Bloemhof Girls High School in for for high school. Um, so before moving to Stellenbosch, and then went to Stellenbosch University. Yeah. Now remind because I'm not looking at your CV, but did you study an LLB straight away? Become law first. Okay. So I, <laughs> I'm I. You laugh. When you, Tell us the yeah, story. Yeah. So when you first asked <laughs> me to do this podcast, I was like, Oh my god, Rob, I am probably not the most lawyery lawyer. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, so I didn't set out to study law. I wanted to be a businesswoman. I don't think I had any idea what that meant, <laughs> but, um, but I hated accounting. So <laughs> as many of us do. So become law was kind of my way of trying to find, um, you know, a, 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 a business um, foundation, but also with, you know, I loved Ali McBeal um, and love to read. So I thought law may give me some other options. And so I started off doing become law. And the LLB, again, wasn't really because of my fierce need to become a lawyer. It was rather because the, it, was, it, it would give me two more years at university <laughs> rather than just one if I'd done some like a, a, a honours or something. So um, it kind of happened by mistake, but I'm very happy that it did. I appreciate the honesty because, again, <laughs> there's a lot of people that listen to this um, uh, that that will be in a similar position where, or they have, 
you know, they'll be in their careers now, but they will have a similar story whereby, you know, they, I, I meet so many lawyers that didn't really set out to study the law, you know, and kind of found themselves in the law. But it's interesting that you, even from an early age, you wanted to be in business and, and, and obviously law is such a massive part of that. Um, and I guess, you know, you mentioned Ali McBeal and there's a lot of people that I interview that, that talk about those kind of shows and, you know, latterly nowadays it would be suits or something yeah. like that, but people don't, people always say it with a bit of a joke or like a, a bit of a jovial, oh, you know, I used to watch it on TV or LA Law if they're a bit older, you know, but that's hugely powerful. Like there's stuff that Very. you watch and then you go, well, I want to do that. Um, but obviously most of the law isn't <laughs> quite like I was going to say, I think that that's also why it's such a um, um, a big shock when you then actually enter the, the world of law and realize it's nothing like it. <laughs> it's nothing like it. <laughs> it looks way more fun on TV. Um, well, that, that, that's good because, again, that, that gives us an idea of, of how you were shaped. And, you know, you, you, obviously, t you obviously took to it as well. It's, you know, it's not like you were studying something that was a, was a hard slog. You, you could see, certainly maybe the BCom law, uh, the way it's set up, from my limited understanding, is that it's not as law-y, if you like, as the LLB. That's a good introduction for you to, to see the world of business. And is it a bit more practical, I think, isn't it? It's a bit more in the sense of like shows you the business. Listen, I don't think university is very practical, no. generally. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> mm. yeah. um, but so I wasn't a great student either, if we're, if we're being honest here. <laughs> I was a terrible student. I um, I very rarely went to class, to my shame, looking back at it now. You're not the only one. Um, many of people but, to this exactly the same. But having found out at a late age that that I have ADHD, I now realize <laughs> what, 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 what part of the problem was. Um, what it did give me, though, is the ability to hyper-focus. So I was great at kind of late night when everyone else is at be, uh, you know um in bed then i could you know go okay i have less chapters less hours than chapters left and so then i would just speed read <laughs> um and somehow by some kind of miracle i managed to get two degrees <laughs> but you know <laughs> amazing yeah but that's see that's but that tells a lot about your character and and, and also the the way that you learn and 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 you consume information and it's probably stood you in very good stead as your career has has gone gone along and again i keep saying this you know that there are many thousands of people that will be listening to this exactly the same and maybe if they're at an earlier stage maybe they're studying maybe they're just out of university or or, or in the workplace and they haven't quite got to where you, the the realization part yet where Oh, you know, and they will do later on, but it, it's an important lesson to learn. And I, it shows that you're very adaptable. You sort of adapted your the way you are to what was in front of you and you got through it and got two degrees. And and, and I like the point about, you know, doing the LLB because it gives you two extra years because <laughs> I know how much fun you ladies were having at university. We really the were. The stories that I hear quite often, which is great. But but it's, but that's really, really important to understand because it's it's the, it's the basis of, it's a basis of who you are, really. Or certainly, the person yeah. I know. But. And I think it was also listen. I, my parents were both the first in their families to go to university, and so it was never a question that we would have to go. You know, because it it really made such a massive difference in their lives, coming from small towns, um, and really having to make that happen for themselves. Um, and so they really wanted to give us that opportunity. And my mom had actually. Um, they also didn't want us to have student debt like they had. And my mom had actually, when I was um, in my final years in high school, she actually went to the university and got a job at the university library because I don't know if it still works like that, but in those days, the university, one of the perks for working for the university is that they paid um, class fees for your children. And so, so she got the job there on the basis of so that you and your brother. Exactly. I mean, so she had a, a kind of half day job, so they didn't pay for every. So it wasn't all free, but it, it certainly made a big a big difference. And and they were then the able things to, we do for our kids. Uh, exactly. She literally just changed she, jobs and, and careers and went. She I ended up working there for twenty years. Um. So I mean, so I mean, I think it was a great move for her too. But I mean, that really is what she was prepared to do, to to make sure that we got an education. <laughs> yeah. Um. But so my point is, I think those the, the late night studies. A lot of it was just driven by 
fear of, you know, disappointing them, costing them another year's worth of money that I knew that they didn't didn't have. It's not, it's not to be underestimated as well, because I think if I think back to myself at university as well, a lot of the things that got me through it was the fear of letting mum and dad down, to be honest, you know, as you were cramming late at night and going, uh, i got to get this done, I've got to get this done. done. You can't, you can't turn around to mum and say, I've failed. Yeah, but whatever. If it, it worked, so that, that's perfect. Um, Okay, so you're you're studying and uh, you've got through with your two degrees and you're ready to um, to start out in the big wide world. And is this when you went to London? Yes. So at that point, obviously, everyone around me, well, it felt to me like everyone around me was doing VAC work and trying to get articles, and I had no idea to where even where to even start. Mm. I had. There was no pool for me to try and do any of that. So because I didn't know what to do next, I went to London and I was very lucky that some of my friends, including your beautiful wife, <laughs> had the same plan. So, um, yeah, so... A all- fear of missing out. <laughs> of each of you is like, you're going, I'm going, you're going. <laughs> I'm definitely going. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, um, and yeah, I mean, I'd been working, you know, we'd all actually been waitressing and I'd been doing wine tastings at like Neil Ellison by Escriff throughout university. So I'd saved some money um, and my parents, um, f- as a graduation gift, they said that they would pay for my ticket to London. Um, but yeah, so we landed, we arrived there. Um, we all kind of slept on people's couches for the first few weeks. Um, and then when we got jobs, we managed to get a, a tiny little flat and four of us um, had a two bedroom flat where we shared double beds. Again, <laughs> as, uh, as, uh, as South Africans and Australians and Kiwis do when they come to. When it was it's so it lucky was, it was only four of you in, the, in a house. It's typically like nine to 15. I know. So. No, we were, we were really lucky. It was, it was actually a really lovely place. Um, and yeah, so I think I, I think I probably spent six months sleeping next to your wife. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean. It's good that you did, because that, and, and, and good that you came to London, because otherwise I would have never have met her. Yeah. So, so thanks for that. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, but the, so, obviously, for those who don't know, I don't know if it's still available to South Africans, but uh, yeah. that that would have been part of a two year visa program that, yes. that used to exist. I don't know if it's still yeah. Does. I don't think it does either. So, in those days, you could get this two year working holiday visa mm. um, if you were, I suppose, like under twenty five or something. It was age. Uh, there's the age restriction. And so, yeah, we were very, very fortunate that we had that opportunity. Um, yes. Yeah. And I, th- this for me is, and I'm not going to talk through uh, all of the jobs that you've ever had, but we'll, I want to pick out certain ones, which I think may have shaped where you were headed you, from your LinkedIn profile, at least the first key job in London was with totallylegal.com, which is still going, I believe. And it's a job, website for lawyers, um, but at that time would have been probably the market leader Absolutely. across the UK, maybe even further than that, for specifically for, for lawyers, for jobs. Yeah, Absolutely. And it was, it was so serendipitous. I arrived in London and literally on day two started going, oh, I probably have to send my CV out. And the first job um, in a, like a, an actual, you know, like a, a physical newspaper, saw an ad uh, for graduates with a you know law background, um, and I thought I was going to meet a legal recruiter, but when I when I got to the interview, um, it was Bernard Howard, the founder of TotallyLegal.com, and he was looking for a you know kind of all round office manager, whatever did everything, but it was such an amazing job because there um, I got to see the back end of a website, and I mean in the, that was two thousand and four. So I mean, it was early days yeah. for the internet. We were checking our emails once a week, or you know, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really early days um, for that kind of thing. And he was such a visionary man. Um, it was this tiny little company. We were four or five people in the company. Um, he was so ahead of his time. He had a South African guy in sitting in Greece doing his the uh, the website development, which is the, now the norm. It's just now the norm, <laughs> but then was extremely extremely un, unusual. Um, yeah, and it was such a great learning curve. He, um, we, and I think my love for tech, you know, really started blossom, blossoming then. Um, I remember buying this book, Goldmine for Dummies. So he had this kind of CRM system, like, I don't know, Salesforce yeah. today. Um, 
but obviously not cloud-based in those days. And um, we figured out how to do mail mergers. And so I read this book, figured it out. So we we got my housemates in, in the evenings. We sat there with the legal 500 and like whatever financial books. And we were, because we also had totallyfinancial.com. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and we would input the names of every director of every law firm with their contact details into Goldmine and then do these massive mail mergers. And I think that that was really instrumental in, I mean, the I think the lawyer.com yep. um, purchased totallylegal.com a few years later for a, quite a quite a big sum. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, think, I thought it was, a, yeah, I thought it was a different media group, but definitely got bought by a media group. Yeah. 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 And, um, but yeah, so it was a fascinating time to be really in the heart of a start of a tech startup. <laughs> Yeah, because for those that are listening and don't, aren't familiar with totallylegal.com, if you think back what now would have been 19 years, right? Yeah. You're talking about, like you've said there, uh, the real beginnings of the internet. Um, those who are a bit younger than you and I think that it's been around forever, <laughs> but it hasn't. And the fact is you, you, you mentioned there with the um, mail merge, these things hadn't even been invented yet and are now used regularly. Yeah. Um, very, But also for you... Because totallylegal.com is still a very, you know, a powerful brand, especially up in up in Europe. But, but you were there right at the beginning, and seeing that startup, seeing that being part of what what it takes to build not just a company but also a tech platform must have been quite inspiring for you. It was, and it was such a big lesson in marketing. I mean, the 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 the. the the ideas that the sales, I want to say team, but it was like one person, one marketing person and Bernard and me, that was, yeah. that was the company. <laughs> but I mean, the, 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 the marketing things we did, I mean, we were handing out flyers in um, Canary Wharf. We yeah. were traveling. I was traveling up in, in my ball gown up to the, 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 the law colleges, you know, in Oxford and Cambridge to go and sponsor the bar for a, <laughs> for a dinner there or whatever. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I was having a lovely time. <laughs> But my point is, is the the it was it was you know it was just an all round incredible learning learning experience and and so inspiring. And for you as well, it must have uh, again. I don't want to overuse the word inspiring, but it must have sort of set in motion something about you that you like that sort of tech environment that. F that startup environment that 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 kind of has followed you around. Absolutely, and I mean, remember my um. My father was an entrepreneur. He started his own business while he was still at at Great Constantia. He started his own soil preparation business. And he then, we'll talk about the agri-revolution mm. later, but he had this incredible idea when I was in high school that he, um, you know, so he'd been running his own business for a long time and then started pursuing this dream. And so I think entrepreneurship is in my blood a bit somehow, I think. Mm. Um, and the And so, yes, I was definitely very drawn to that. And people like you said, uh, sorry, was it Bernard? Bernard, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and sort of visionaries like that who can see things. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's so funny that you that someone who's driven by that and has that entrepreneurial spirit sees that advert in the newspaper, which I'm not sure they do anymore. I don't know. Do they still advertise jobs in the newspaper? No, and I don't think. Especially I, coming from a, a website that and applies. And I think it, I think it, I think jobs. it was only because it was his own job that he mm, that yeah. he that. I mean, that, you that think that he put, that it, put it, it on his own, but it's not for a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, kind of, yeah. um, okay, so look, you had a good couple of years in the UK, as yep. I know, because I was there for the back end of it. Yeah. Um, the and then you came back to South Africa, where you moved to Joburg, right? Yeah. So yeah. that was also an odd story. So after I. Um, I did a stint of caring <laughs> for a while. Um, I, I decided to leave that illegal to do a bit of traveling, ended up doing caring for a bit, and then joined another another kind of tech startup, Energy Quote. Thought that I would stay in London forever, was waitressing on the side to be able to pay for my four-year working visa. But my parents really wanted me to come back to South Africa to go, come and do my articles. They were kind of like, just get the qualification behind you, and then you can go and do whatever you want. But just... You know, it's a fair point. just do this. And a lot I was, of people would have heard that from their parents. Yeah. Just get the articles. Just get the yeah. articles. Become a qualified attorney. And so I was very resistant to that. But then, again, very serendipitously, with my dad having this invention, he had registered a patent and he was speaking to his patent attorney, um, who at the time was practicing at Kish. Um, and who said to them, and so they were talking about, you know, my dad's daughter who didn't want to come back and, you know, whatever. And so he said, well, um, one of his fellow directors from Kish 
will be in London next week, you know, perhaps I should send my CV in because they're still looking for article clerks for the 2006 intake. This was beginning of December of 2005. <laughs> so it's starting And next so month. did that and um, got an email saying, you know, can I meet this person at a coffee shop in London? They would like to interview me. I was nervous as hell. I didn't know whatever. So I started furiously reading up about intellectual property law. Luckily, I had intellectual property law as a um, in my final year as a as an elective. Um, started reading up case law <laughs> whatever just to try and prepare. Uh, met uh, went into this coffee shop. Um, I remember the suit that I got specially for this uh, for this interview, and in walked the most fantastic man. Um, I, I can never stop smiling when I think of him. Um, Brian Wimpy is a legend in the South African trademark world. Um, and red hair, earrings. So not the Johannesburg not, lawyer yeah. I expected at all. And we just hit it off. Um, and a week later, I was on a plane back home to come and do my with, article. With a job offer to do articles with him. With him in Santon, yeah. And like so, you say, serendipitous that, that your dad is speaking about the, the, with, with his attorney, and then you know, he happens to be going the following week. And yeah, <laughs> yeah I bet your parents were very pleased. But, very, yeah. very pleased. So, yes. I mean, and were you ready to come back and ready to to do this? Obviously, and thought, you know, I can, I can do this. Was, yeah, I mean, largely, I guess a lot of it's driven by the fact that you've met Brian Wimpy, and then you've gone. Well, I can, I, I can get on board with this. this Absolutely, yeah. and also, I think that. One of the reasons that I didn't go into law is that I had no understanding of what the what the possibilities were. I know some of your other guests have also spoken about this. Mm. Like we were not prepared at all to understand what the different career paths are, what the different whatever. I loved intellectual property law when I did it as an elective, but I somehow thought that because so to become a patent attorney, you have to have some kind of technical or science. Um, qualification and an LLB. And so, but I thought all intellectual property attorneys needed to have that. And so I didn't th think it was an option for me. And if no one's told you. And then. no one's ever told me. And when this then became an option, I was like, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Um, no, I think you're right. I think that that point about the, the, the sort of not really being 100% clear on what career paths a lawyer can take or what it really means. I mean, it's a mixture of, uh, your age and lack of exposure to really what how the world works, yes. but I've always said this, and I don't mind saying it publicly. I've said it to the the law firms that I, uh, I'm sorry, the law schools that I've spoken at um, with the deans of law is that you really need to do more about mm -hmm. speaking to to people about what careers are on offer because there are so many, and even more so now. But like you say, other guests that we've had on the Unicorns podcast have also spoken about. I don't know what I can what I can do. Um, but it's nice that you, again, very similar in terms of, I can think of my own career. A lot of it was driven by really wonderfully meeting the right people at the right time yeah. that really bring something out in you, which obviously uh, at Kish, um, uh, Brian did. Um, then, now Kish, for, the, uh, for those who are listening, don't know, leading IP firm here was called DM Kish is now Kish. Yeah, so it used to be DM Kish in those days. Now Kish, they're the oldest IP firm in South Africa, um, and they, I think, very much deliberately did not want to grow too big. Mm. You know, so it's a it was a lovely environment, um, lovely environment. And Brian was an excellent teacher and and such a great mentor, um, and you know, with a very hands off approach that is really. The style that I like. <laughs> yeah, kind of micromanaged. Actually, let you develop your exactly, your, and really, you know, yeah. and and um, I think different to many other article clerks, he also pulled me into some really big matters and let me run with things that you know he he put a lot of trust in me. Obviously, overseeing things, yeah, but not from, but not you know. I want to say fixing really. grammar in my in my emails, you know, really just guiding from a from a from a um, you know a, a, a real mentoring perspective. And yeah, so that managing really from this, uh, overseeing, but allowing you to not so much make mistakes, but allowing you to grow within. Absolutely, within the role. and I think that that's that was also absolutely um, critical. 
um, because that also allowed me to basically write my trademark exams. Um, the trademark practitioners' exams are notoriously um, seen as difficult because they're practical exams. Mm. And because you know, by the by the end of my articles or even before then, I had done so much um, and had the opportunity to really get my hands dirty. Um, you know. I was able to to to, to pass those oh, so in my second year. Yeah. The exams are very much like in if you were given this scenario, what exactly. would you do? And if exactly. you haven't done that, then yeah, but you had, which yes. is amazing. And um, so yeah, so that was really amazing. Yeah, I know from our experience in recruitment and uh, some of the work that we've done that I've done since I've been here that Gish lawyers tend to be very very good, very strong, very well trained, and that also feeds into what you're talking about there. Once you le- decided to leave there, you joined what was then called Denise Rates, right? Which, again, is another firm that doesn't exist anymore. It's now part of the Norton mm-hmm. Rose Group. But, but I know for a fact that, like, you know, it was a firm that was incredibly highly thought of. I mean, if you if you worked at Denise Rates, then you were a good lawyer, right? Yeah, so the – I loved Kish. And for a long time, I thought that I would grow old there. <laughs> but then at some point, I, I think it is this – business-minded something in me started getting restless. And so I actually started speaking to people outside of law about going into branding strategy or advertising, whatever. But it was quite sobering that I would have to start after I've just gone through articles and just, you know, getting a proper lawyer, you know, proper attorney salary to have to go back to kind of being, um, you know, a beginner was, 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 um, something I couldn't really wrap my head around at that point in time. And so then I decided I should I should at least then just try and get some more commercial law experience. And that's really what prompted the move to to the nice rights, then the nice rights. Um and again, my career has been a very it's been very weird. I think it's as it I always feel as though, you know, you get momentum and then you I always know when 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 it's the end of something. Mm. And when I get that feeling, they might not know, but they <laughs> might not know, but I know. And I also know that somehow an opportunity will arise and it always does. And so, so you trust your gut a lot when it comes to the moves that you absolutely. make, which is really, really good. I actually. don't with, with a lot of other things in my life, which is weird, but yes, with my, my, with my career, I absolutely did. And so I had met one of the directors of um, the Denise Rates IP team mm. and a, you know, something that we, you know, some kind of matter we had against them. And so I reached out to her and I said to her, listen, I want to get some commercial experience. If there's ever an opening, you know, please let me know. And she came back to me and said, oh, serendipitous. <laughs> she Come is, again. she's leaving Denise Rates and there is a space. So whatever, send my CV. So I did, ended up there. And as you said, it's a fantastic firm. Um, but it was a difficult fit for me, um, I think, because um, as a an IP lawyer, you charge fees. You char- don't charge by the hour for most of the work you do. And all of a sudden, I was plunged into this firm where you had to log your hours, <laughs> which was a yeah. – and um, I mean, we're talking sort of, uh, yeah, 14 years ago or so. 14 yeah, years yeah. ago, exactly. And for me, I always found – charging by the hour, the most anti-productive thing you can do. <laughs> I think there's many people that will listen to, listen to this who will 100% agree with that. But And so I found that, I mean, I was in a lovely, lovely team um, in the intellectual property team, um, met uh, Dick and Nelly, one of my great friends who sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, had a lovely time there, but I don't think that I was a great fit um also those big firms tended to move quite slowly in terms of um technology (laughs) and so at kish um they use this it's this um uh ip management tool called patricia i think most firms use or did in those days um and while we were there we you know and with my gold mine experience you know i went in going okay but why aren't we using this more and we started kind of replacing physical files with, you know, keeping electronic records, figuring out how to um, link it to Outlook so that your emails could be pulled into the ma- the matter on Patricia automatically, you know, things like that. And then I landed. But shouldn't be we shouldn't dismiss that because you're talking about stuff that you were thinking about 14, 
15 years ago or so, which now for many lawyers out there working would just seem like the norm. The norm, yeah, but absolutely. But it really wasn't. It, it really was like, wasn't, it's, no. Yeah, it's, again, groundbreaking in the sense of, utilizing the technology in front of you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, and at the time, Kish was already doing a lot of this. And when, you know, we, as the young crowd voiced, you know, possibilities, it was explored, which I loved. Whereas in the bigger kind of ship, it's not so easy to, 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 um, to, to make, you know, that kind of change on the fly, I just want to say. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, this is probably, uh, you, you know, not for really for you to say, but I can certainly say it because I've just, because I've obviously had a career working with firms of all shapes and sizes. I think you're right there where one of the things that um, the bigger firms have, have always struggled with, maybe they won't as they embrace technology more, but is that sort of those levels of, I loathe to say bureaucracy, but the, the, the sheer size of them to try and get people to start doing things in a slightly different way um, is sometimes difficult, you know, especially if they're, hugely successful i was having a conversation with someone recently uh about work-life balance and uh, within law firms and and i said to or you know it was on the day i think that k l gates in the u.s had just announced record profits for the year of like okay don't quote me but uh, maybe five billion dollars it's like well how do you tell a firm that's that they're doing it wrong well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's not about doing it wrong it, it, i suppose with that system it's about there's other ways of doing it that can speed things up, but it's it's sometimes harder to get people to come onto your side, but especially listen, if you're a June junior yeah. lawyer. Again. And so, but and, and listen to their credit, I wasn't there long enough to see the fruits of of what mm. of my campaigning, but my, they did actually get. <laughs> so, like, so there might be some people working there now going, <laughs> "Oh, it was her." <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I mean, it was a big. They still had everything in physical files, and they, for example, had a folder on the computer called faxes. Oh, wonderful! And so every fax that's ever come in just went into the fax thing. Scanned. And then they had a fantastic way of like naming it so that you could find it again. But, you know, so you could go and search in the fax folder for the reference number or the name or the whatever, and you could find it. Um, and so while we didn't have the system, you know, I started going, okay, let's just start and opening a folder for every matter. And let's just like start putting, <laughs> Makes sense. you know, making a, an electronic version of what we have in the cupboard um, uh, for every file. And so... But yeah, so again, for me, I think that that's kind of the, I've always been driven to find ways of automating things, ways of better structuring things so that it wastes less of your time. So that's, you know, that's what, what technology is for. <laughs> I, although saying that, there's something about going into a lawyer's office and seeing files everywhere. I, uh, uh, there's a, a, someone I went to see recently and I'll leave his name out because, well, because you know him, but uh, there, were, there was files everywhere. And I was like, this must be like a comfort blanket or something, you know, just to feel, yep. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't put them away. <laughs> They've got to be out. But, but this, see, that, that tells me a lot about you as well. And it tells the listeners a lot about the way that you think. And, and even in an early stage, you were looking at ways to improve things. It could be the entrepreneurial spirit coming out and you again from you know that, that your father obviously passed down to you. The and I think it's important as well because again, I meet thousands of lawyers every year who are stuck sometimes uh, at a firm where they don't know how they can get that creative um, unlock that creativity in them. Uh, and and sometimes it's like you know. I'll say, you know, have you, have you approached it or are you just assuming that they're not going to listen to your ideas or, or perhaps they do need to be in a, in a, in a, in a different place? One thing that has changed, uh, and you will notice, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, but you will have noticed the, the right now we're in a bit of a revolution when it comes to legal tech, you know, and, and the use of technology in, in, in law. Uh, we're really at a crossroads where you know, it's do or die, uh, which is wonderful because there's so many tools out there. It's, it yeah. is exciting. It's almost like, you know, an industry that doesn't, didn't want to change for so many years realized that they've got so many thousands and millions almost of talented people. And now they've got the best tech. Yeah. Times yeah. are changing, but it's excellent. Uh, so, okay. So you, you leave practice and you, and you go to FMB. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in the IP side of things. Yeah. So six months into being with Tenacious Rights, maybe even less, um, I hear that the IP legal advisor at F and B is leaving. 
they were my client or Bryant's client when I was at Kish. Uh, for those who don't know, FNB is one of the large, large banks, banks here in South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. yeah. And so, and FNB is part of the first round group. So I emailed the head of the first, <laughs> first round group's straight legal to the team. Top. Straight to the top. Yep. <laughs> he used to be my client. So, and I say to him, listen, I, you know, I see this person has left, um, you know. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, send your CV. And so, um, Seven months after joining um, Denise Wright, I walk in at FNB, um, and what an incredible, incredible job um, working in. So um, on the IP side, of on things. the IP yeah. side as IP legal advisor, um, and sitting in a wonderful little. So the the bank has legal advisors spread out through all of the departments, but then there's this kind of central team that have these specialist lawyers that that kind of serve the the the, the whole bank, and so yeah, incredible. Incredible team there. Just in terms of the people, but also the environment. People, the environment, the, um, the focus on innovation, mm. the, um, the I want to say such a big organization, but with such a startup, you know, culture and heart. That's nice to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And so the innovation is absolutely, um, there's, they have this big innovation um, competition every year. Um, where, and I suppose today, I don't know how much it is today. I think, I'm sure that they still do it. But in those days, the team, you, anybody could enter any type of innovation that you thought would help the bank. Do internally. Something. Internally, so, okay. yeah. That could help the bank do something better or faster or make more money or whatever it would be. Um, and then the winning team would get like a million rand. Even then. Even then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. About 10 million rand. Yeah. Now. yeah. And I mean, that was what, 29, 2010. So it was. Which, given know, current exchange rates, probably a... about £5.90. <laughs> yeah. but, sadly. But yes. Yeah, Especially after last night. Yes. <laughs> um, see, that's brilliant. I didn't know that about FMB. I don't really do a lot of work with them. But the fact that even back then, which is, you know, 2009, 2010, is they're, they're fostering innovative thinking across all different departments. Absolutely. That is. That is, that's really good to know. One of the things that I was going to ask you, um, and I always ask the guests this, but you've kind of answered it anyway, uh, is you know, what are some of the decisions and actions that you've taken that you think have attributed to your success so far? But you're already saying it. Like you, you, you've, whenever you've seen an opportunity, you've gone for it and you've just not held back. You've not been afraid of no. Um, which I know that about you anyway, but also it's great for the listeners to hear that because again, it's something that a lot of lawyers that I deal with, certainly from when I'm doing career advisory work, is is the there's a natural risk aversion with some legal professionals that you know the the what if question, yeah. which is perfectly fine, but sometimes I have to coach them to get over that. Whereas you've got that, you've you've not been afraid of the no. You, you you've just put yourself out there and said this is a kind of a direction that I want to go into. And that I'm right, right? That's you as a person, isn't it? That you, you're prepared to take an, uh, yeah, a chance. I think it's the idea of getting a no is much less scary than boredom to me. And I get bored. That's a really, <laughs> that's a really good point. Because you said again, I mean, tie back that into something you said about five minutes ago, which was about you've been, you're quite careful with other aspects of your life, but actually with, um, with your career, You've, you're prepared to take a chance and it'll be partly because boredom is really scary to you, but also because I think you've got a lot of faith in your ability, clearly, you know. Well, not, I think my ability to, to swim in the deep end, yes, but I think anybody has that. I think people are just scared, but I figure, you know, there are people much less qualified with much less education doing much harder things in, in life, you know. If you're thrown into a situation, you'll figure it out. I mean, there's what's the woman uh, Marie Folia has this podcast. She um, and she has this thing that nothing is unfigureoutable. <laughs> and if that's I mean, a word. Yeah. <laughs> Take a, a moment there to to change some batteries and, and cards. But um, you were just talking about uh, we were talking about the bravery you've made in 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 your career. And one of the lines you just said there was about um, boredom is more scary than change for you, which is again you know it's so inspiring <laughs> for lawyers to hear that because i find again i've spent two decades in recruitment now globally and the and the issues don't don't change wherever you go in the world is that some lawyers are just a bit frightened to take that 
that next step and um and, and luckily you did but I know I was going to say actually when you said about that about boredom of scaring you I remember what you briefly touched on it earlier when you were in London and you did a bit of caring for a while <laughs> you also unbeknownst to anyone apart from me you 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 once said to me I think we were, must have been out for a drink or dinner or something this is years ago oh, we I'm were just in our scared 20s. about what this is no, going to no, be no. you said <laughs> You said, I said about learning Afrikaans and you said, oh, okay, I can help. And then within a week, you'd gone away and written and and typed out a whole, almost like <laughs> frenetic dictionary of how to learn every word in Afrikaans. And I carried that with me <laughs> everywhere around the world to the point where we came back. And I, when we moved into our new house a year ago, I still had it. Oh my word. Um, and I, I, I was like, I, because it was so much work that went into it. It was like, yeah, you give Kareem... <laughs> Holds camp five minutes <laughs> and, and, a, and, a, and a laptop, and she I produced a whole diary. I loved doing you. that. Oh, yeah. my word. Well, it didn't go to waste. It, got, it went around the world. Um, but th that is, Your Afrikaans isn't great, though. So. No, no, it was, I, well, I wasn't say I did. I used it much. I've got to be honest. But I always say that I understand more than I let on. No, you do. You know, I, I know I, you do. I'm just joking. I'm just saying my my um, my uh, Afrikaans teaching amazing. skills are obviously not. Um, there, there's a book in there for you and, uh, when, when you're next looking for another project. Um, so, right, you you are that you're this professional. You're developing yourself. You're, you've you've worked at some great firms. You're learning commercial. You've been in house. You're 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 still driven. You're still challenged. You want challenges, right? I Absolutely. mean, that's what you want. And you've uh, and I'm not going to go through every single job you've ever had because so apologies to those firms that are really really good that you uh, that, that we might skip through quickly. But then you you joined Clickertel, which is a telecoms company, right? You, you were there yeah. for about three and a half years or so. Yeah, but that is actually that is actually probably the most pivotal move I ever Tell made. Me. So yeah, <laughs> um, the so loved Evan B. As I said, loved it, and then my. Husband, now boyfriend at the time, gets a job in Cape Town. Oh, yes, because you were living in Joburg, right? Yeah. Yes, living in Joburg. So I say to him, okay, go, you know, go. I will come, but I'm not going to start sending out CVs and stuff. This job is too important to me. Yeah. Um, but if uh, if uh, an opportunity presents itself, then I will I will join you. And so we actually rent out our flat in Joburg. I move into my uncle's house in, in Joburg. Samuel moves down. We rent a house here. We commute. And a month in, he's out with a friend who's kind of, oh, you know, you're done in Cape Town with Karin. And he says that, anyway, he knows of someone that that may have a job for me. And it turns out that he is friends with the then CF, finance director, I suppose, of Clickertel. Um have my first Skype interview oh. <laughs> sitting on my bed in Joburg. <laughs> 13 years ago? 13 years ago, yeah. Trailblazer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Trailblazer. And also with um, their CFO was in, in the US at the time, so kind of a, a global interview, we'll say. It was lovely. Joined Ticketal and it was absolutely amazing. The That real kind of Silicon Valley startup mm -hmm. culture, they had just um, gotten their second round of funding from Sequoia, who also funded Yahoo and et cetera, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the CEO is also from Cape Town, although... Yes, exactly. Yes. And I mean, Clickadol is probably one of the biggest South African startup success stories. And um, Peter de Villiers and his, his, his brother Cassie and their friends started this company. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do yourself a favor and go and search for some interviews that they did about how they started. It's such an incredible story, literally starting in a garage, putting cell phones together, um, to wow. send messages from one SIM card to multiple phones, etc., and now they are, you know, definitely a leader in um, in um, kind of text based communications, I suppose, um, across the world. Um, and they've only recently closed another round of like ninety million US dollars um, of funding for more expansion and new things. Um, so, and the founders still involved? And yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And so I land in this job not knowing anything really about tech. Now I am the only legal advisor. So <laughs> it's commercial, it's technology, it's communications law, and it is global. <laughs> what an amazing opportunity. <laughs> and so I just get dumped in this. And so... Yeah, listen, but that's perfect for you. Clearly, because, you know, there's no boredom in there. There's like, you've got to learn, you've got to go, you've got to move a million it was miles absolutely, an hour. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. 
Um, and I call that that period of my my life thumbsuck thumbsuck law, because you know I had a good basis in law of you know because of my experience and my studies etc. But I was completely new to all of this that landed. You know. <laughs> but also it feels like a it, well, it sounds like at that time as the firm they're going through the second round of funding they're like there's still that startup vibe and, exactly. and maybe it was thumbs up business as well like re- we're going to do this today <laughs> exactly. yeah. it really was kind of building the plane while Clearly you fly um but yes and it was such a lovely environment again where innovation was encouraged where um and because I was their first in our council I was also you know so I I wasn't relegated to the law i could get involved in product development to make sure that you know the dream job for a lawyer who wants to move in the house every single person is always i want to get closer to the business i want to get closer and you had it absolutely um you you know our um our mutual friend uh dale Fassad, Mm. i think when he was at drm wrote this article once and that struck me so much about the difference between firm lawyers and in-house counsel. Yeah, he did do that, yeah. And, Shout um, out, Dale. Good yeah. article. Yeah. And, um, and he, I mean, listen, the metaphor is a bit shaky, but it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it landed. It was this like, are you a shepherd or are you a sheepdog? Mm. With this idea of like, if you're a sheepdog, you're called in when there's trouble. You're in, you're out, whatever. And if you're the shepherd, you walk with the flock, you know every sheep, you, you know... You you know in the way that they walk that there's something wrong or that there's whatever you think about the whole flock as your as your family and so and that's really I think what what why I think I gravitated to towards in our so much is this really being part of the business understanding the products understanding what it is that we're building understanding where it is that we're going understanding you know what it is that we're trying to achieve and then figuring out okay how do we how do we do this in a way that is compliant? How do we, you know, contract in a way that makes things move faster, et cetera? You're just describing the in-house role that almost every single in-house lawyer who's listening to this is dreaming of having or like, you know, they're probably going to clip it and send it to their, their board and go, that's what we need to do. You need to get me involved from the very beginning. Because, yeah. Um, I, I, so that must have been hugely like challenging and, and and again though if you go back to your the beginning of your career at totally legal you're, you're there at the beginning of these startups or very much close, well, they to, were, they close were, to the beginning no they were no i mean listen click it all by then so that was say 2010 so they they'd been in the game for about 10 years by, by yeah, then but, but they, still in their journey in their journey it was very much and it was very much a time of growth and new new products new markets you know i mean trying to figure out how to open a company in kenya trying yeah. to figure out you know what are the communications laws of nigeria you know? <laughs> um and very ahead of their time i mean we were trying to do things um that we were able to do in south africa you know where, where, where that we were able to do in south africa but the telcos elsewhere in africa didn't have the technical capability Probably didn't have the infrastructure infrastructure yeah. to do some of these things and so to try Try, try and figure out what's possible and what's not and how do we do it differently and how do it's we... It's interesting because yeah. at that time we were, myself and Marie, we probably just left Cayman. And, yeah. and I know that we there was a company going across the Caribbean at the time called Digicel. And they were, I remember talking to their senior directors and they were like, again, what you're describing is very similar, but across the Caribbean uh, region. Um, like, And their biggest problem was not the products and the services they were it was the infrastructure. Yeah. They were having to go in and actually build the infrastructure mm-hmm. alongside, you know, I think it, it seems to be doing quite well now. They always seem to be, you know, still around. They seem to be on all the sports stuff and the cricket and everything. But so they, but, but, you know, going in, going, can we do this? Well, yeah, legally, but there's no infrastructure. We've got to build that as well. That, that mm-hmm. must be fright, well, not frightening, but challenging, exciting. Yeah. Well, yeah, you went was- through the same thing. It was lovely. And so I think that, you know, but I want to say three, three and a half years later, after having now come from somewhere where, you know, they had, you know, we, it was, I started there, they didn't have a legal team before. So it was literally getting risk management policies in place, getting, you know, setting up all of these companies, making sure that we, you know, complied with all these laws, you know, whatever. Well, with one person. <laughs> Don't we know her? Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I had dinner with her the other day and she said, oh, I used to work. And I was like, oh, yes. Yeah, so, when, yeah. so um, 
And then yeah, so when she left, another another good friend, what that ended up being another good friend, um, um, also um, uh, joined me. But I think after three and a half years, we'd built the base, you know, and then I got bored again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because now it was kind of business as usual. Now we've 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 done all the hard yards and things were now running this relatively is shaping, smoothly. Again, you're not the only one, and this is great for people to listen to because this is where you're starting to shape your career and where and find your feet within business, which is clearly you're that that you're the startup person. You are that yeah. yeah. And then yeah. you joined Radiant, which was at that time. Exactly. And so what right happened at the beginning, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so what happened there is that in my boredness, I came across an article about Cognia Law. That's also mm. a legal process outsourcing type. Yep, based here um, in Cape Town. Based in Cape yeah. Town. And um I took a chance and I emailed Janet, the CEO. And I said to her, listen, this is who I am. I'm, I tend to do that, it seems, yeah. every now and again. Well, it's a good tip for people to listen to. Yeah. Emailed her directly, just kind of randomly guessed her email address. Um, got it right. Got it right. Um, and was surprised when she then responded and um, invited me to to what I thought was an interview, but ended up being a test. Um. <laughs> that was the test. That was the test. <laughs> We're not going to tell you there's a test. Yeah, but what was interesting is that um, she was actually recruiting for Radiant Law, not for the for not for Cognia at the time. Interesting. And um, and so Alex Hamilton, another great visionary, started Radiant Law. Yeah, I'll just point out as well to anybody listening, they can find Alex Hamilton and Janet Taylor uh, Taylor Hall on. All the socials. Yeah, absolutely. Follow them. Don't don't email them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't email them. <laughs> Certainly follow them. Um, These were the Alex, days I, before before social media. <laughs> Alex, I, I, I do follow on Twitter. Uh, you know, a uh, real leader in that legal tech space. Um, absolutely. But, in, but interesting already that what I suppose is el- possibly competing firms, Radiant and Cognia, helping each other out. Uh, which... Yeah, but I think they had they had kind of and again, yes, competing in a in a sense. But listen, the pool is big. I always feel like you know, competi- your competition is also your best friend. I, I was going to say know, the same be... thing, but it's also something that uh, Leo Mozzelli and I were speaking about. Is this in the legal tech space and the alternative legal services provider space? The the uh, the attitude is much more of a sharing attitude. Rather, of course, they compete, but it's much more yeah. about let's help each other out, and that's great. Absolutely, mm. and um, yeah, and so I um, so anyway, so after the test thing, it was on a, I was invited to an interview on a Saturday morning with um, Alex had flown in from from the UK, and the guys that were going to run the South African office. Um, um were they were they were they were all you know they'd gotten a room for the day we were doing they were doing interviews i was their first interview and they hired me on the spot <laughs> poor people sitting up outside in the <laughs> no but there. no one else was i, I, oh, I don't right. know so it was so they were anyway so it was it was absolutely lovely but i think my um my startup experience my tech love of tech and i mean personality Ale- attitude but anyway, um, Alex is all about all about using technology and process um, to do things quicker, easier, better, cheaper. Um, and yes, it was it it was a, a it a, it was an interview. They hired two two more people on that day. We all ended up getting drunk at Potluck Club, <laughs> <Really? laughs> celebrating, <laughs> celebrating. <laughs> and so, I mean, a, a few weeks later. You know, they'd secured an office in Westlake, and we, you know, we we started, you know, with Amazing. what what we had, and that was such an incredible journey. Also, to, I mean, they had some really really exciting big name clients in the UK. We were part of their in in our legal teams. Um, it was me, um, and and um, a few senior lawyers, and then we got these really young junior lawyers that had basically never seen a contract in their lives. Um, you know that that were negotiating in, and and drafting and vetting contracts for these for the UK big, clients, big yeah. big UK clients, um, and it was amazing to. I loved that the the training and the mentoring and all of and 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 all of that. So I I absolutely loved it. 
Um, and working at a high pace, high pace for UK clients, demanding like and, and learning, and 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 also at that point as well, uh, which Radiant, you know, from my knowledge, have done very very well at is is what you just said there. Look, looking at better ways of delivering legal services quicker and having tech as a key part of absolutely. that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And that's something they really lead the way in. Yeah, and I mean, so this was, what, 2014? Yeah, and, you so. know, we were already doing, um, you know, ago. doing using um, uh, contract automation software for clients, you know, to, to kind of auto-complete from your CRM, for example, or, you know, to tailor your templates depending on what product it is you're selling or what whatever um we uh, internally we were, we were using a lot of technology um and trialing and, some as well I absolutely like absolutely um no it was lovely and and aside from the actual work and the um and, and that it was also lovely for me to be at the real start of a startup mm. you know literally figuring out how do we do recruitment how do what are our hr policies you know yeah. <laughs> like what you know who are we where are we where going where are desks from exactly <laughs> <You know. laughs> and so I that mean, there was, is an element of fun in that bit there is yeah absolutely we're... um but it's um Listen, startups isn't for for the weak at heart. Um, yes. It's it's a lot of hours and a lot of stress, um, and you know the and if you have a team that's dependent on you and whatever. I mean, I have so much um, respect for any for anybody that starts a business um, and takes on the financial burden of that. I mean, I didn't have that at least. I was, you know, I was there pulling a salary. I was, you know, putting in the hard yards, but I, I wasn't ultimately responsible for this team of people. Um, and so I'm in, in awe of, of, um, of the Radiant founders. And yeah, it was, it was absolutely lovely. I loved it. I love the clients. I love the environment. But it was also exhausting. Yeah. Um, and I. Well, there's no end when you're a startup and and you're driven by um, uh, founders that are uh, you know passionate and you know have a million ideas. Absolutely. There's no end, and I know that because I've been. <laughs> there's no end to the drive and the determination to succeed, and and yeah, it can be exhausting for those around you. Yeah. yeah, and also, I mean, these guys came from big London, big New York firms. They, I mean, the work ethic is just incredible. The attention to detail, the the, I mean, it was such a, an incredible environment and learning experience for me. Um, but it was, it was a, it 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 was a lot of hours and listen. But it was me putting that pressure on me, you know. Yeah. I um at at um when I when it when I ended up deciding to 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 move on, I had this discussion with, with with Alex and he was just like, You should have told me, you know, like and I mean listen, and they were very accommodating with everything, but I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um and I think I've just burned myself out. Yeah, I've um, seen it as, I've seen it before with people who've worked for me and and I think I and you know Alex will uh, and and other entrepreneurs and and business owners will will probably adhere to that as well is that you don't always spot it and and I think my age now I've I realize that you, you you know you with people that are how do you put it people are can be their own worst enemies sometimes in the sense that they're so passionate about what they're doing for you and they're building and helping you build a company and and they believe in it and they believe in the services and the products that you're putting out there and that's exactly what you want but that if you don't if you don't stop them they will burn themselves out yeah. and you clearly did and listen um, but I listen I mean they were also going a million miles yeah. an hour you know they it was <laughs> I mean, listen we had big name clients and more work than than and a recruitment, as you will know, mm. is not as fast as you think. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and it takes a lot of time. Um, Otherwise, you're just churning through exactly the last five minutes. Yeah. And you and also, I mean, to get to 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 get to the level of quality, you have to you know um, make sure that you train people and all of that stuff. So it's it really is it it was an incredible environment. Um, it really was lovely. Um, but yeah, but then at some point, I was exhausted, but also. Um, uh, even though we got to know our clients really well, um, I felt that gap of, of being in the business, yeah. you know, I was, yeah, because you had taken a step out, 
gone back to being a service provider. A service yeah. provider, exactly. And we did work very closely with, with our clients and very much as an integral part of their in-house teams. But yet we weren't on the ground, mm. you know, we weren't. Um, and so I felt that. And so I wanted to go back in-house. Um, and then luckily for me, an ex-colleague from my Clicketile days who was a recruiter, she was working at Acceleration. And um, when they were looking for a legal advisor, she Talk thought of me. Yeah. And now uh, Acceleration was uh, and uh, was that in the advertising space? Yeah. Or? So Acceleration is another South African startup success story. <laughs> um, I caught them in their more mature days. Um, so they also, they started in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, um, started doing um, kind of Google ad type products um, and services and implementations, Google AdWords, all of those kind of things became really big um, uh, marketing um, uh, tech resellers, uh, okay, implementation yeah. partners. Um, and then also when literally no one understood did it. Google. Exactly. <laughs> and then also um, started doing um, really high level marketing um, technology and data consulting. Um, and they, when I joined them, they had just um, uh, been not fully acquired, but the WPP group is a massive yep. um, global advertising um, group um, that owns many of the well-known agencies over the world, you know, across the world. Um, they had bought a stake, a purchase stake in, in Acceleration when I had just, and so it was kind of around at that time that I joined. Um and so it really was that space of kind of this uh, scrappy startup now having to kind of start conforming with yeah, the big corporate, becoming corporate, the yes. big corporate ship. Um, and so that was also a really interesting learning curve. Challenge, yeah, absolutely. And um, and I want to say I was I stayed there long enough that you know I I was there when it was still kind of startup and all the way to. Absolutely corporate, <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> um, which is also a big learning curve for me um, and amazing to see um, and just reaffirmed to me my um, that I'm more of a scrappy startup <laughs> yeah, it, And then you sort of navigated through the, the WPP yeah. environment, uh, 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 which takes us up to nicely to, to the present day. But yeah, I can, I, I, I've... I can think of the firms that I've been at, and I, I, I remember one when I first started in recruitment in London. Uh, I worked for a firm that had done really, really well—that scrappy startup uh, kind of vibe—and then they were bought out by a big American group just as I was joining. So similar to you, and I, but I remember they had a, I think what they call in the US a town hall, you know, so where yeah. the, all the staff got to stand in front of the CEO and and the, the and, and a few other senior directors and ask very direct questions, questions. which. <clears throat> I had just joined, so I didn't have anything to say. But it was interesting. It still stuck with me because one of the questions was, "How are we going to keep the culture that we built?" If you know, you know, and then obviously they they spoke about you know, we're, nothing's going to change, change. and everything, <laughs> but it inevitably does. And I actually, funnily enough, because my in my career I started uh, my first job out of university was in mergers and acquisitions, so in, in an M and A department. And the one thing I learned immediately is that as soon as you get bought. Things change. Things change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they will. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole purpose <laughs> of them buying you, is so that they can implement their own processes. Um, so that that is interesting. But look, what I'm seeing here, and I and I hope the the the, the listeners and the watchers are also getting the idea of is someone who is not afraid of a challenge, not afraid to change things for whatever reason that may be, whether it's boredom or whether it's mostly, but, but, <laughs> but someone who's also you know oh, is brave and backs themselves and 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 also from a very early age, almost from studying, in fact, definitely from studying onwards, someone who's recognised that in themselves that they're tying the law into business and it's business that really drives you and like you say that sort of scrappy startup um, is kind of your niche spot i think i said to you a while back i vaguely remember saying something to you about that that's going to be your area until you retire in the future so anyone globally that needs someone with legal understanding <laughs> that is a build-up phase call kareem because i think in the future you'll you'll make it that'll be a nice consultancy for you but look <clears throat> this is something that i really want to shine a light on which is the business you're involved in now which is uh, agri revolution 
It's your, um, it's largely your family's business. And you touched on it earlier with your father having the idea for the, for the invention. Um, and really what I want to get to is the fact that again, showing someone in the law, someone who has created their career, both in service providing practice, in-house, largely startups, more mature businesses, you've uh, someone who's not been afraid to take different directions. Um, the, you're now embarking on what, uh, and I'm not joking here, seems to be, and I'm not just saying because we're friends, obviously, but <laughs> it, the, the invention, I know nothing about farming. Obviously, I'm in one of the farming capitals of the world, <laughs> but I know nothing about it. This townie from, from South London doesn't know how to, you know, barely know how to dig a hole, let alone <laughs> farm. But the invention that you and your, what your father came up with that you are now taking to market and is, well, it is a revolution. And, 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 you know, I will put the link to the video and uh, in the, uh, below, because I think everybody, what well, I watched uh, again, watched the, the, the video on the website this morning, which features your father and your brother and uh, maybe another person, uncle. And uncle, <laughs> uh, but other people and also customers, people in wine farms that have used the, uh, and for, uh, to, for clarity, the product's called Earthworm, right? Yeah. Um, and what it does for the the world of farming, what it does for uh, the world in general, in terms of climate change, in terms of an expanding population with less room. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be just spouting what's on the video, <laughs> yeah. minute, but I want you to tell us. First of all, I'm very interested in in, in the fact that you've you're you're going more into this this space now. Um, but please, for the listeners. Tell us about the product and the company, please. Sure. Um, yes. <laughs> Start from the beginning. Please tell us what your dad came up with the idea. And Sure. So, um, yeah. So, as I said, my dad had started a soil preparation company where he had big tractors, bulldozers, whatever that. And so he prepared soil for farmers before they planted whatever, you know, whatever crops. Yeah. So, so for the uninitiated, he would assist the farmers, huge, great land. To prepare the soil to be ready to be for planting, planted. exactly. And through this time, and um, he, and also during his time at um, at Cruz Constantia, they, he kept on coming to this place where you could do everything above the ground you could, but what really made the biggest changes to yield increases, to quality of fruit, etc., was when he started doing interventions under in the soil. So underground. Um, and in his mind, he came up with this thought that what if you could have like a concrete mixer underneath the ground? Because then you could use the depth dimension of your soil. So instead of your roots only growing, you know, 20 centimeters deep in the topsoil, what if you could make topsoil of like a meter or 1.2 meters deep? So expand the topsoil. And by the cement mixer analogy, you mean sort of constantly like, turning. Like homogeneously yeah. mixing in whatever you, you know, like whatever is missing from that soil. So if you can analyze it beforehand, you can figure out what's missing to make it really fertile. Now, if you had a way to mix that all in, in a homogeneous way. And get to that level. And get that deep. How amazing would that be for plants? He was also part of an experiment at um, Nidfur Bay um, Experimental Farm in Stellenbosch in the 80s, where they literally, I, I always say they dug a swimming pool. <laughs> they dug a 20 meter by 20 meter um, square um, up to 1.2 meters deep or a meter deep. They took out all the soil. They tested it. They put in fertilizers and whatever other ameliorants they, they thought was needed. And they put it all back into this hole. Then they took a single vine. And they planted it right in the middle. Um, and this vine grew massively. They put up pillars and it just grew massively. By the end of four years, that vine's roots had spread throughout that swimming pool, <laughs> right to the edges of where they had put in. This, in just four years. In just four years. And after four years, they harvested, in one year, they harvested a thousand kilograms, a whole ton of grapes from this one vine. Now, generally, a vine produces, I don't know, depending on where you are, what a lot of factors, but say three, Roughly. four, five kilograms. Three, <laughs> four, five, three or four wow. kilograms versus a thousand. And in. They wait, made, wait, wait, when, when, what year did they do this? This was in the 80s. 
so okay. Okay, so this was in the eighties when they did this, and they did this by. I mean, they did the mixing and stuff by hand. Okay? Yeah, of course. At yeah. the time, and the um, also they made wine from this from from the grapes from this single vine. Oh, so they were wine grapes rather. than They were wine grapes. wine grapes, and it came out in the top five percent in blind tastings. So the quality was great, and the I mean the yield was just incredible. And so this is really, I think, where my dad's idea of the concrete mixer <laughs> came about. Was like, so if you could do that for every farmer, you know, yeah. what what, what amazing can you do results for other crops. crops. Yeah. Exactly. Own the future of recruitment today. Access a secured, anonymized global talent pool. Connect with qualified candidates through multiple private label databases. By creating your own Stintit, you can achieve the following. Step one, access your company dashboard by logging in. Step two, click Find Candidate to search for the ideal candidate. To begin, create a new position and fill in the necessary details. The system will search through multiple databases to find the ideal match for you. Step three, once the search is completed, you will instantly receive multiple 100% matches, which have all been fully verified and KYC checked. Step four, when the candidate chooses to opt in, you can view their skill set and experience. Only when you are satisfied, use your credit to unlock the candidate's full profile. Once unlocked, the profile remains unlocked for all future searches. What makes this system truly revolutionary is that when you search, the search will continue in all the different databases until a 100% match is found. Each database involved and the candidate share in the revenue. And that's how this circular revenue model and shared database benefit all parties involved. Uh, thank you. Well, we've just had a little interlude, uh, we, but where we left off was you were talking about the experiment with the earthworm or the certainly the, the theory behind it um, in the 80s that your dad had and the um, incredible results in just a small patch of land for specifically for, at that point, uh, uh, grapes for wine uh, rather than table grapes. And then your dad having that thought process of what else can, I mean, if you can do it for this, then surely. Um, it can be done for on, on any type of land for any type of product, right? Now, I, I, where I, I know it's probably too much to ask, but in the next forty years, <laughs> where, where, until now, where where have we been? Where have we been with this incredible invention? So, um, listen. So, my dad had this thought about it in the eighties, but it was only really in the in the kind of late 90s that he came up with a solution okay. that he thought could work. Um, and so when I was 16, 17, he um, had a guy build him like a, a, a small scale model of what he calls rotational penetration. So we're, we're working on the term. <laughs> Spitballing some ideas around that. Spitballing some ideas around that. So, um, and it's a it's a way that he's figured out of, in a really energy efficient way, mixing soil really deeply. Because the problem is, the deeper you go, exponentially, the 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 power needed to Makes to sense. to move under the soil becomes more and more and more. And so he figured it out a way to do that in a really energy efficient way. And so he built this model and it 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 showed him enough that he was convinced that this will work. And so he then from scrap <laughs> made a life-size model. So when I was in matric, he made this life-size model that he had um uh, at the back of a tractor and that, you know, um that dug itself into the ground and could mix the soil. Very basic. It, and so it, we're talking like, like you know, proper tape and yeah, like, yeah, yeah exactly. like nothing fancy in Afrikaans we would say spook and pluck like oh. literally like you spit and like yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he's, like he's put it all, all together, together himself yeah. um, and it worked um, it worked 
but it fell apart like minutes later kind of thing. <laughs> and so that set him off on this course of... Um, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make this work. Yeah. And so over the course of many years, he somehow scraped together um, the money to build three working prototypes. He did more than a thousand hectares of work with these with these prototypes. All, all in the Western Cape? Or mostly, mostly in the Western Cape. But he also did some work for mine rehabilitation in Richards Bay. Incredible results restoring um, uh, soil that was de completely depleted through mining by, you know. Um, so, all, again, I'm simplifying this for yeah. the, the non-farmer, but rehabilitating land that's obviously, I guess, near destroyed by mining, but actually getting it to a point where it could be used for farming again. Yes, exactly. Oh, my word. That's amazing. That's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, and the other thing about the, what he wanted to do was he wanted to build something that's narrow enough to go into existing orchards and vineyards. Because when you when you farm with something like uh, know, citrus or apples or vineyards, whatever it is, you you plant your tree, your baby tree, <laughs> your yeah. seeds. I don't know what it was usually a baby tree or a, or a, or a small vine. Um, and then it takes a few years, four years, five years, eight years, whatever, for the plant to reach full production. Then you have a few years of great production. But then over time, your soil gets more and more compacted. Yep. And that makes sense. your, um, and then your yield starts, your production starts declining. And at some point, often, mostly, the, you then get to a point where you're making too little money from this block um, and you have to take it all out. It makes more sense financially for you to take it all out, um, re-prepare the soil, yeah. plant a whole Fellow new orchard, field and, and, plant and that, a whole yeah. new orchard and start from scratch. But that means that now you've had a few years of declining returns Plus, now you have the cost of replanting, and now you have another four, five, whatever years before the new plants are back into production. So my dad's question was, what if you could go in, regenerate the soil, cut off the roots, and let give them a whole new home <laughs> yeah. to flourish in? And Effectively work around the roots. and well, I mean Not around cut through them and yeah. then they will oh, okay so actually and get rid of the debt as you would in your own garden in your own garden you yeah to exactly let it flourish down there you exactly. can do the same, same thing. thing prune the roots and um and he had amazing results incredible results with 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 these previous models um but then i mean it's it's it really has just been years of bootstrapping, trying new things, trying different angles, coming up with new ways to solve some of the challenges that he experienced. Um, and that ultimately led to him um, coming up with these, so registering two new patterns um, for that solves all of these challenges that he'd encountered. And then in 2020, and this is really when I started becoming um, more involved. My brother Yaku has been very involved with with um, with the development of the machine, etc., for many years. Um, and my dad and his um, uh, business partner Louis, um, the three of them had worked on this for many years. Um, so in 2020, um, they had reached the end of quite a drawn out application process for funding um, with the Techno Technology and Innovation Agency of South Africa. Okay. And so literally, I want to say seconds before lockdown, <laughs> yeah. um, Jeez, the, that. <laughs> the funding was approved. And so, um, I became involved because, um, in the negotiations, the contract negotiations with, with Tia, um, and then, well, and your IP expertise and, and your commercial, my, all of those things. But my point is, that's kind of what 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 would drew me into the business. Mm. But then once I was in, <laughs> no out. there was no no getting out. But I was also I'm I mean I've been so passionate about this. You know, the Earthworm is my baby sister. <laughs> you know? yeah, it's been a part of your life since you were uh, you since know, I was a kid. Absolutely. A kid. But I think again, I'm, I'm going to say it again. We're going to put the link to the video and, the, and, and to your website, um, the um, the company website. It, down below, uh, and I advise anybody that's watching this to to watch the video. It's six minutes long, and again, I watched it again this morning in preparation for today. 
But you sit there again as a layman, as a business person, but as a layman who doesn't farm, sitting there going, how is this not a thing already? <laughs> how is this not been in, like, how is this not the norm? And, and just off camera as we were waiting for the electricity to boot up again, you know, you used a great word, which is, you know, when we were talking about your dad's involvement and since his inception, uh, the idea 40 years ago, you, you can't leave because you're compelled. And, and uh, because it will, it will make, work. It, it will well, work. it will work, but, but it will make a difference. genuinely make the world yes. a better place. Now yes. I say that, and I know that people will immediately go, Ugh, <laughs> you know, because this is what we hear all the time. And, you know, um, you know, I'm the type of person who likes to be given information. You know, I'm neither, I'm neither, you know, avid, oh, I'm a, uh, there's climate change happening, we must do something about it, and I'm neither the other way, a, a climate denier. I'm in the middle of going, right, tell me more. But I'll watch that video again, and some of those things make sense. Increasing population in, in, in highly dense areas, um, running out of good quality farmland, uh, the farming practices as they are at the moment, as you just sort of mentioned there, in terms of there's little option but to let it go fallow and then come back and replant. Um, the the need to uh, to regenerate mining uh, areas or areas that maybe um, for one reason or another can't be farmed in. The earthworm answers all of that, right? It does, and I mean, listen. This is this is this is <laughs> probably not what your listeners um, tune in in for. But yes, absolutely. I, I mean, we absolutely believe that it's going to make it's going to change the way that we farm in ways that brings us more in line with nature. I mean, the the on top of the the effect that the that this machine and what it does has on on roots and on plants. It also now gives us a means of actually um, mixing carbon mm. into the soil, and I mean the 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 soil is the biggest carbon sink um, other than the ocean. And imagine what we can do to climate change if every hectare of of agricultural land can become a carbon sink. I mean, yeah. I, again, I watched that video. I was like, well, this is the answer. This is well. I mean, it's not the answer, but it's no, it's an answer it's an, to a lot of things that we all answer, read about. But also, perhaps it's something that makes other people think of new ways, better ways, whatever. Even if this is just the the start, even if this just lights a fire in someone else's mind, you know. Well, well that's exactly. I mean, you the, just. I was sorry. Go on. Yeah. I was just going to say that the, you you say there that this is probably not what our listeners uh, listen in for, but it is exactly because what we have all, and what I've always wanted to do is shine a light on. South African legal professionals who are then going on to do something different. What you're doing is you're you're branching into a whole new area. Obviously, clearly, it it um, it is something that's within your family. But this is not this, this is not a product that it, you know, will be gone tomorrow. This is this is something that will that really actually has the ability to to improve the world. And that's why I know from personal conversations, you are talking to a number of organisations across the world um, that are that are deeply interested in in the product, and not just you know not just investors, but governments and government organisations that are wow, okay, let's let's look at this and let's see what we can do. Because as we all know from everything we read, governments all over the world are worried about what the, the the future might hold certainly from a climate change perspective and from a from a feeding perspective yes. of, um but okay well, i mean what what is what are the next steps for for, for you and, and your journey <laughs> and, and with, with agri revolution um so i um i've been as i said i've been kind of evenings Early mornings, weekends, I've spent for the past three, four years, um, you know, I've spent really, really um, uh, working very closely um, with with my dad, my brother and the team. And um, since April, I am now full time <laughs> at Agri Revolution, which is the biggest privilege of my life. I, I get to work with my family every day. Um, we... Um, and we get to your family are really nice, but I mean, some, people, <laughs> some people can work with their family. And go. <laughs> but listen, if you have a shared dream, yeah. you know, and a shared passion and a shared purpose, 
Um, well, I said to you off camera, didn't I? I? Again, watching that video this morning, you can see it in your, certainly in your brother's eyes. You can see that, that, that passion for that business and, and, and for the product and what it can do for the world, like a, a genuine improvement. And, and, and the, the proof is there, clearly. That, I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier, but you, the trials that have been done, on the, not on the land, but just on the crops as well. Like, you know what I mean? You know, yeah, we think it's a no-brainer, but then, I mean, we always joke and say, my brother and I have been brainwashed through a dolphin. So. Yeah, yeah. You will like this, and it will, will. <laughs> Not at yeah. all. No, but I mean, we were, I mean, my dad's always been, because he's so passionate about it, I mean, like, this is this is what we talk about in my family. <laughs> every Christmas. Every, every, every dinner, every lunch, every Christmas, every phone call. But it's not, it's not that easy to get funding. It's not that easy no. to get the message out there, is it? I mean, yeah. and, 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 you know, the, the, the uh, the organisations that you would have to work with to get the, to get it to market as you are doing now globally they move slow. We're talking about governments and we're, and, and government uh, entities and farming entities. You know, there is a yes, slowness, absolutely. not not for the lack of desire, but just because of the way that they're set up. But then I think also, and I think something that my dad is amazing at, and you you talked earlier about me saying that that we were compelled. But so my dad would often say that. He had when he got this idea, when he found, when he saw the solution, he knew, he knew what this was going to be. But, and he every day he went, he has he has this amazing thing that he goes to bed every night with a question, believing that by in the morning he will have the answer, and if it's not tomorrow morning, it'll be the, the morning after. And this is really where, you know, he's kept on innovating, innovating, innovating over all of these years. And he has this unwavering belief in, and not a belief, knowledge that this thing that he saw the answer to is going to, other people are going to see that answer at some point. Um, and he's seen this machine in his mind's eye working, changing lives, changing the lives of farmers, of rural communities. I mean, it's and well, farming in general because farming in general and so and so this of, is the thing is like once you've <clears throat> once you've seen that you are compelled to to be part of it you are you it's just a no brainer well yeah because you've got the opportunity here i mean again i i don't say this thing lightly you know you've got the you've got something in front of you that can that will genuinely change the world and the way that people so. The, the pay, the, like you said, rural communities, jobs, the way that we eat, the, the, what can happen to the land, the regeneration, looking after climate change and climate control and uh, carbon, and, and, and it answers so many things. How could you could never walk away from that? You, right. And I could see why your dad is sitting there for years, going, well, no, "It's just a matter of time." It's just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. I think the from a from a from a career perspective, from you, which you know your career is. And I know the listeners will will, will love this, the hearing your whole journey because it's so, it's so, like brave and, and wonderful. Okay. And you've changed and you've adapted. And one day you'll sit there and write a book. And go, <laughs> but you know, from from a from a small all the way from a small website to big law firms, banks, and to the farm. You know, there's 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 a book in there. Oh, okay. it, but there might be a movie in it for your dad. Actually, <laughs> like, you know, I, when, when you said about the the, the wine tasting, um, you know, coming in the top five percent of that land, uh, I thought of that wonderful film with Alan Rickman where they where they did the blind tasting for the for the American wine. I can't remember what it's called now, but um, it was a really wonderful movie. And I thought I was like, oh my word, there's a yeah, maybe of course won't want to be in a, in a star in a Hollywood movie just yet. But you never know. But what I'm trying to say is that you've got this, you've got from a career perspective, anyone listening to this, it, it, what you've got, what the calling that your dad has and the opportunity that you have with Agri-Revolution is, you know, it's a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity in the sense that, um, and I would advise anyone that listens to this, if you've got a feeling, if you've got something inside you that you, however big, small, not everyone is going to have the opportunity that your family have, which is to change many, many lives. But even if it's just changed their own life, to, to do it. Just do it. Absolutely. Take a leaf out of Kareen's book and and be brave and do it because don't ever leave yourself wondering what if. And it's some, exactly. of, the, some of the advice I, I often give you know, you people I, when I'm doing the career coaching and stuff like that. And Rob, listen, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. 
at the same time, and not disagreeing with you, I want to say that I haven't been that brave. <laughs> well, it pays to me. Yeah. In in the sense that I mean, this was three years of of clinging on to a, a salary <laughs> in a job that I enjoyed initially, but it was, as I said earlier, becoming more and more corporate. I, you know, more and more boxed in yeah. and less and uh, less and less of what I found rewarding. But I, and, and so I was going to say is also things aren't overnight successes. Yeah. Changes yeah. don't have to, you know, you don't have to be brave and then tomorrow your life is going to be different, you know, the, but if there is something that you're passionate about and you believe in, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, if you start taking steps toward it, somehow things, things work out. Um, that That's perfect advice for, for, for the people, for people that are out there, because I know, I know from the feedback that we've had about the podcast that, that people who listen and, and then wonderfully, and thank you so much for feeling compelled to write and email myself or LinkedIn message or whatever it might be, or the team that they, that they're inspired by stories that, that yeah. like yours, which is, I'm saying brave, you're saying calculated risk, perhaps, <laughs> but, no. it, but it's, 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 you know, it's trusting your, yourself and trusting your gut. And, 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 you know, for those who are potentially listening to this thinking, well, I should start that business or I should follow that dream, but you won't regret trying it. And that's yeah. what your dad and your brother and yourself are doing now. And, and I, you know, we, and it, th this, and I'm not just saying this because I don't say these things lightly. This is another South African su success story that everybody's going to be knowing with, before, before you know it. Um, but it's also just what you said there. It's perfect advice to sort of end on. I think, um, I think I want to thank you for coming in and talking to me today and sharing your journey. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I, you know, I like, I keep using the word brave, but you've made calculated decisions. You've trusted your gut. You've trusted your instincts. You've, you've had an incredible career that's taking you through different, different uh, industries and different countries and different, uh, you know, and, and dealing with companies on a global scale. Um, you obviously get a, a thrive on that startup environment. Um, and now you've got your effectively your very own as well. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you so much for coming in. Good luck with everything. And, uh, and, you know, I'll see you very soon. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much for, for the platform. I think I've enjoyed your podcast and your conversations with your other listeners so much. And so I don't, you know, I think that my story is perhaps not everybody's cup of tea, but I, I believe that, that, that there are probably people out there that have, that have similar stories. And so please continue doing what you're doing. Mm. I've loved listening to it. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.